Hello and welcome to the Rad Dad Podcast. This is your host, Kirill Zabowski. Today, my guest on the show is Greg Godsman. Greg is a venture capitalist from sunny Seattle, and after doing a 20-year marathon at Madrona Capital, Greg has recently started a fund of his own. It's called Pioneer's Career Labs, and it's both a startup studio and a startup fund. First, they come up with an idea for an exciting startup. They test it to see whether there is a market. And if they find that there is a market, they fund the idea and take it to the moon. Honestly, this is one of the best things that has happened to Seattle's startup ecosystem in years. Greg's come on the show to talk about the lessons he's learned as a VC for over 20 years, as well as being a dad to three wonderful kids and how those two worlds work together. Let's dive right in. Greg, welcome to the show. Tell me... Why Seattle? Why not San Francisco or the Silicon Valley? For what we're doing, I can't think of a better place in Seattle to do it. Mm-hmm. Just the quality of the, of the engineering talent here, I think, is second to none. Uh, I think there are some great entrepreneurs, but there's a lack of capital. And so if we could be a piece of filling that hole a little bit, then I think that's, you know, uh, a great opportunity for us, and, and hopefully we can create some great companies. Uh, how did the idea for uh, the labs come about? My background is that I was at Madrona for 20 years, and while I was there, uh, I helped to start a bunch of companies from scratch. So it was involved early days in, in Redfin, for example, uh, and then started this company called Rover.com, which... Uh, took place because of a really bad experience we had with our family dog at a local kennel. You know, now the company will do, you know, $400 million in, in you know, in billings through the, through the marketplace. And it's just, it's just become the largest pet services company in the, in the world. That was really, really rewarding as an experience. So one of the things that I went back to my partners at Madrona and I said, I wonder if we could do this more systematically as opposed to ad hoc. That was a then I started something at Madrona after that called Madrona Labs, um, which essentially was could we do more rovers? Could we do more Redfins? Could we do more Z2 Lives? Um, and we started creating companies from scratch. And one of them, the first one we did was a company called uh, uh, what was called Spare Five at the time. But now it's called Mighty AI, which is a great company in the machine learning uh, area. And um, uh, we did another one, um, which was called Reply Yes, changed the name to Message Yes, which was sold to, to Nordstrom recently. And so the idea, though, was could we take what we were doing at Madrona Labs and really scale, scale it up much more significantly and um, I thought we could, and that was sort of the, the initial sort of uh, kernel of the idea for what now is Pioneer Square Labs. Importantly, we wanted to do it with some great people, and so, so we had that initial team, and, and off we went, um, raised money from a bunch of venture capital firms, and, and started the studio building these companies from scratch. Um, and so we've raised... Uh, 27, a little more than $27 million for the studio, and then we just raised a, a venture fund to go alongside the studio to invest both in the studio companies as well as in uh, external companies that have nothing to do with the studio. Yeah. I mean, we're trying to build a platform for great entrepreneurs here in the Pacific Northwest. That's sort of the, the, the yeah, big I, idea. It seems like it's working. Yeah, I think it's working. Let's step back for a second. How did you become a VC? You have an undergrad degree from Stanford and a joint MBA and JD degree from Harvard. That's a pretty impressive resume. And a lot of people with this background would probably go work on Wall Street or maybe consulting, something like that. Why venture capital? Well, I was going to go and work. I wasn't one of these people that thought, hey, I want to be a VC. That was not my uh, uh, the way I thought about it. Uh, I've always been a person that... That focus is really on being around great people. Uh, that was my number one criterion was uh, how can I, early in my career, put myself around just great people. Mm-hmm. And so I had spent the last summer bef- of my JD MBA at Goldman Sachs doing 
you know, tech uh, M&A and, and some banking, and, and I really enjoyed it. And I would have been very happy to go back to uh, Goldman Sachs. I had an offer in both San Francisco and in uh, New York. But my wife, who's also from Seattle, said, uh, and she's an attorney, and she's like, you're going to at least try to find something in Seattle. Huh. And I said, uh, yes, ma'am. I said, yes, <laughs> of course, you know, I'm happy to do that. But, uh, you know, I was going to do a little bit more of a perfunctory search because I kind of thought it would be fun to be in New York for a couple yeah. of years. And so I talked with uh, all the usual suspects. I got some actually really interesting job offers. And then I talked with this this group called, at that point, it was Madrona Investment Group. It was not a venture fund. In mm-hmm. fact, it was more of a private equity uh, fund. They're doing, um, you know, looking at sort of uh, less technology deals at the time. Um, we had a relationship with the Bass Group and out of Texas, and we were looking at big, uh, you know, bigger business opportunities to leverage these f- four amazing individuals who had just historic, you know, accomplishments in business. Jerry Grinstein, Bill Ruckelshaus, Tom Olberg, and, and Paul Goodrich. I thought to myself, gosh, you know, I just really admired these these four individuals. I think it was probably a third of what I was going to make at Goldman Sachs in terms of the pay, but that wasn't – just felt like the key was to be around, again, uh, people that I really felt like I could, you know, aspire to be one day. And mm-hmm. so I joined this group, and, um, you know, that was then 20 years later, you know, I, I was still there. So – um, and it was because they're just really incredible uh, people. And then I was sort of part of, uh, you know, Tom Alberg had made this investment in this company called Amazon, which wasn't Amazon at the time. And uh, we started seeing a whole bunch of more business plans around tech. And I sort of suggested that we should go and and uh, we had made we made a bunch of investments. We were very successful, and I suggested we should think about raising a fund of outside money mm-hmm. uh, to basically invest in more of these companies more significantly. And uh, we were successful in doing that. And, and you know, looking back now, I, you know, Madrona's raised over a billion and a half dollars and have been really sort of a, a, a sort of the key venture firm here in, in the Northwest for, for, you know, the last two decades, really. Mm-hmm. So you, you mentioned something very important that, you know, you didn't go the Goldman Sachs route and instead you just went to work with people who you admired and thought you could learn from and just have a yes. fun time working. And that brings us kind of to college because that's, in a way, what you learn from college. Well, I still remember my college days, right? So uh, that's probably the best part, all the friends you meet and kind of how you work together. Uh, but nowadays, the environment is changing. College is becoming really expensive. What you get out of it at the end of the day is not entirely obvious, except for the network, maybe, right? And um, and then we have the Pioneer Square Labs, where like if you know how to code and you want a job, you could you probably better off just coming here and saying, "Greg, do you have a job?" Right? Like I'm like 15 and I'm awesome at what I do, and you might have a really good experience, right? Better than college for some. So. What do you think going forward, right, going from where you were, you know, 20 years ago and what what that experience was like and maybe where do you think it's going to go 20 years from now and mm-hmm. how, how should people think about college versus all the other options we have available now? No, it's, a great, it's a great question and it's not an easy one. Um, I did actually a TEDx talk on, on the uh, topic of student loans, which I think are, have become oppressive. Um, I'm still a big fan of college. Uh, I think not. it's not just about what you learn in terms of functionally, but I think there's a social element to it. Uh, I think it's a time to where you can find yourself. Uh, you can go and explore a whole bunch of different areas that might be of interest to you. So uh, I still think uh, college is the right choice for people that, you know, can do it. Mm-hmm. I do think that we have to be open to different types of options. But again, I'm a big fan of, of college. I, I've taught for the last 17 years at the University of Washington mm-hmm. in the computer science department and in the um, business school. I still think there's a, a massive role for universities and colleges to play in you know preparing all of us for all the change that's happening. 
uh, and especially you know, young people for the change that's happening. And I don't think it's a good idea to just skip that. Mm-hmm. That being said, I think we have to rethink rethink college a little bit. So, for example, one of the things I talk about in that in that uh, TEDx talk is that there's a stigma with regard to online education, for example. And um, I think all of us have to decide at some point, hey, you know, maybe for certain types of, of students, that's actually a really good option, a better option, and, and, and a cheaper option. Uh, and, and, and we as sort of employers need to sort of look at those mm-hmm. options and, and take them seriously because this idea of, of ratcheting up these l- incredible amounts of loans and basically saddling yourself for the next 20 years with loans that are very difficult to pay back doesn't make any sense. And so we've kind of gotten out of whack there. So I think we need to fix that. That being said, I still would always encourage someone to go to, to college if they, you know, if they can get in and, and, and do it. Actually, it's a great point that brings me to another question. How do you help students or maybe encourage them to find their way, given how expensive colleges have become and the questionable return on investment in many cases? Um, on one hand, you can go and do science and engineering and make a lot of money right now. On the other hand, you might want to follow your passion and uh, study history and I don't know, French literature and uh, arts and maybe not make as much money but be happier, uh, right? How do you, how do you decide? Uh, or you know, what, what's your advice for students today who, uh, who are choosing their major, who are applying to colleges, how to think about their future given these costs? Um, I think when we, when you and I and, and people in our generation were thinking about schools, it was expensive, but it wasn't the same kind of expensive. The, this idea of the amount of loans that people would take on were nowhere near what they are today. So I think uh, parents and students you know, need to be more uh, thoughtful about not just what schools that you can get into, but also what, you know, what burdens are you taking on as part of going to uh, this school, and does that make sense? It's still very easy to get loans, and the reason it's so easy to get loans is the student loan is the worst kind of loan that you can get in the world because you can't get rid of it. It's, you can't declare bankruptcy to get around it. Um, it follows you uh, forever. Um, it's just a terrible, terrible type of loan. And so um, that's made it easy for lenders then to, to make these loans more accessible. But the downside of that is, is people then have abused both the lenders and then students and, and parents have abused uh, you know, the amount of loans that they take on. You just have to be careful about that. Um, I also think, you know, I think it's right to ask, are you studying uh, and preparing yourself for, a, for, for a, the right kind of job? So if you major in French literature, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but if, you, if, that, if you're majoring in French literature and you're taking on $100,000 plus in loans, that, that probably doesn't make as much sense. It's hard to say that, but that's right. just true. If you're majoring, majoring in computer science and taking on $100,000 of loans, that actually is more reasonable because the kinds of jobs and the payment and the, and the salaries for engineers is just so much higher than they are for uh, other types of majors. So just being thoughtful and smart about it. Um, I do think that we're going to go through in the next 20 years a very uh, significant change, as significant as the Industrial Revolution, Agricultural Revolution, as machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, starts to take over more types of jobs. I think, you know, obviously uh, truck drivers, post office workers, distribution center workers, but also accountants, mm-hmm. um, compliance mm-hmm. folks. There, there's, you know, there's a, there's, most jobs are going to be affected in some way by this, this tidal wave called... Uh, machine learning, you know, or artificial intelligence. And I think there's going to be a premium on people that can think. And so in some ways, I feel like the liberal arts education, which has kind of gone out of favor over the last 10 years, uh, where folks have started to really put a strong preference on the STEM fields, which, and for good reason, they're the best job. The engineer is sort of the new doctor or lawyer. Yep. Um, 
But my sense is, is that as machines start to do more and more things, I think there's going to be a renaissance for liberal arts um, and just being able to think well. That being said, don't take on $100,000 of loans uh, and major in something where it's completely unclear whether or not you are going to be able to pay those back. Right. It's an interesting conundrum, right? right? If you want to pay your loans quickly, then you should take a degree that will do it soon. But if you want to think 20 years from now, then maybe you <laughs> take the opposite path. But you have to decide for yourself which one is going to be right now, given your situation. Or, or for example, let's say you get into a, sta- a state school and um, you really want to study something that's more uh, – and a, and, a, and a private school that's much more expensive – if you want to study something that's more in the in you know in, in let's say in in literature or something like that, then it may make more sense for you to consider both as parents and as students uh, something where the loans are going to be less uh, less overwhelming. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't want to say that because you want to say as a parent, mm-hmm. just go to any school that you can get into. The best one you can get into, we'll figure out a way to do mm-hmm. it. Um, but for a lot of folks, that has turned into very difficult situation. Hey there, Rad Dads and Moms and other listeners. This is just a quick commercial break. Well, actually, Rad Dad is completely commercial free, but this is a gentle reminder that if you're listening to this podcast and you like it, please go rate us on iTunes or wherever you're listening to your podcasts and let your friends know. Email them, tweet them, Slack, whatever. Wherever you are, just let them know about this podcast. It will really help spread the message, get more people here, and then I can spend a lot more time doing this podcast. And of course, if you know somebody who'd like to sponsor it and just send me a ton, a ton of money, let me know or let them know. All right. Let's get back to our programming. I've really enjoyed every stage of, uh, of being a, a dad. I, 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 you know, I have two boys and one girl. And, um, you know, each, uh, each phase, whether it's through, uh, you know, kindergarten all the way through now to high school, has its own, uh, you know, great rewards and challenges. Um, and uh, I think I'm just glad that I uh, made time to sort of experience uh, each phase as much as I, as I could. I have this philosophy on life that I'll share with you, which is I think in life you get to pick two and a half of these four things. Okay. okay? Uh, one is family. One is work or school. Another is friends. And then the fourth is hobby. So uh, work slash school, family, friends, hobby. And you get to pick two and a half. So, but I don't think you get to pick all four. Some people think you get to pick all four. Yeah. And so you, you can pick all four. You're just going to be mediocre at mm-hmm. not all of them. And so I consciously have chosen, uh, you know, work and family. Those are two. And then I do a half probably for, I don't even know if it's a half terribly. It's like for exercise and, Uh and things like that, you know, but so what that means is that I sacrifice friends. So we do stuff with friends, but very, very occasionally, um, you can just hire friends now, right? (laughs) Um, but not as, you know, and I know people that really, uh, that's an extremely important part of their life. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, and I totally understand that you just have to make choices. And so I don't think you can have, you know, an extremely active social life, you know, be a great parent, you know, work crazy hours Mm -hmm. and also, you know, have a serious hobby. It just does not enough hours in the day. So... I think you have to choose, and if you choose, then I think you can really optimize um, around the things that y- you want to focus on. So I'm probably, my wife tells me, I mean, I, I spend a lot of time on work. I really enjoy, I love what I do. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea of being able to create companies from scratch is like, it's ridiculous that they pay us, that I'm getting paid to do this. I would do it for free. Don't, I shouldn't. Most people are doing it for free, right? (laughs) That's right. Um, So you're right. Most people are doing it for free. Good point. Um, So I love, I love what I do, and I and I really do love being a parent. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and those are the things that this phase of my life that I'm focused on. Maybe when the kids go away to school, then I'll have a whole new, I can then try to find a hobby or something else that's, that I can focus more time on. But right now, those are the things I'm focused on. So you mentioned that before you guys had kids, your wife was an attorney while you were a VC. But then by the time you had your third kid, the family really needed her, and she made a decision to uh, stay at home and raise the family instead of uh, continuing with her job, which I imagine was a difficult decision to make and a difficult transition. How did you guys manage to keep the family together and kind of keep the relationship together all these years, given that you got to keep your job and she had to switch to uh, to be a mom? out of the job that she still loved at the time? No, I think the, I think just making sure that being supportive of each other's choices, I think, is the, is the, is the hard part. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't think I do that perfectly, and, um, but I try to be supportive of her choices because I do think if you were an attorney at like a big firm like like Shannon was, I think there are days where she probably thinks, gosh, you know, and she sees some of her friends that have risen up now to partner and all these other things. And I think she probably wonders sometimes, should, you know, did I choose the, the right path? And I think, you know, 99% of the time she probably, uh, I know she thinks that she did, but, but it's helpful to have a supportive spouse that, that reminds her of, of, you know, that this is, you know, and is supportive of that, of that choice that, that was best for our family. I try to, to do that, but I probably don't do that enough. Right, because in a way, there is no point at chasing some goals, right? Like, like being a partner in a law firm. Okay, that's, that's great, but that's because I think we've been trained, especially, you know, going through school and university, you're trained to try and achieve the A grade and, like, try to catch up to your peers or surpass them, right? And get, being a partner is just a thing, but then really, like, was it meaningful? And in your case, it's like raising a family is meaningful. Like, now it's a, it's, it's in many ways, a more important accomplishment than somebody being a partner. Being a partner is just they jump through all the hoops every other partner jumps through, right? So it's like, how important is it really? You are so 100% correct, and I think as I've matured, so you're coming to this you know, young, but like, uh, you, the more uh, you see the kids grow up, the more you realize how important that is. And one thing that I want to tell you is that the impact that parents have on their children is, I think, much bigger than we'd like to believe. And I even see that to myself. The impact that my parents have on my both positive and negative characteristics is huge. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you know so many of us are fighting uh, whether it's anxiety or stress or all those things, and a lot of that comes from what happened to us as children. Not to get all Freudian here, but but we have really big influences on our children, and we can screw them up. Uh, we can. Uh, do good things. I'm sure all of us, no matter how great of a parent you are, uh, you're going to screw up your kid a little bit. Uh-huh. Because that's just part of the way this game is played. Um, and I think the goal is to try to do you know as little damage as you can and and be su- and try to be supportive. But um, it's really hard. And and now that my oldest is about to go off to college, one of my one of the things I stay up late sometimes thinking about is did I do everything that I could to be a great dad to Zach. I worry about that. Um, I've tried, but there's so much more that I would love to, you know, I just would love to have more time with him. But it's, you know, he's ready and it's time for him now to go off. And and I'll still, of course, be his dad, but it'll be different. He'll be away. Um, and uh, so you got to really take advantage of that time that you have because it happens really fast. It's great to hear because in, in the way you're one of the few dads who feels that way or maybe wants to admit that you feel that way, right? Usually it's, it's kind of put on moms that like moms will feel sad because kids leave. Or maybe it's because usually or a lot of times at least in American families, moms take care of kids so they feel more sad, right? But if you've been around enough, then you do feel that connection. Oh, I'm going to like – I'm going to be a wreck. Shannon will be much – she's going to be probably much more – She's more of a rock than I am. I'm going to be, it's going to be very difficult for me to, when my kids, you know, go away. And they are just, 
such an important part of the fabric of your life. Even if you spend a lot of time at work, it's sort of how you, part of how you define yourself and what's important to you. And yeah, you know, another thing that I'll tell you that's been really interesting for me has been, and you have two daughters, so you get this. Um, I have two boys and a girl, and the difference between raising boys and girls is, is at least in, for me, has been very significant. Mm-hmm. Um, raising the boys has been a lot easier for me. I just, my intuitions about parenting boys are generally on point. Mm-hmm. Uh, my gut instincts about uh, the right way to parent them, whether that's you know, punishment or uh-huh. out of boy or whatever it is. Um, uh, I just, I, you know, I grok it. I get, the, the, I, I look at them and they're much closer to, they think more like I think. Um, I understand them. Um, when they say something, uh, uh, makes sense to me. Uh, with Ellie, my, my 16 year old daughter, uh, my instincts are generally, Wrong. Now, that what's weird is like you would think, like let's say that you were uh, throwing darts on a dartboard, or like a you know you could hit like fifty percent of the time. Mm-hmm. Like my instincts on the boys are like really high, mm-hmm. and like so you think I could get at least fifty percent right on the girls. I'm like no way. I'm like way <laughs> less. And it's, and and Shannon is such an incredible. She's such an incredible parent to both. It's, I think it comes much easier to her, especially parenting a girl but like my instincts are just wrong in terms of what to say when to tease when to uh give her space when to do different things and i'll be honest in in many ways being a dad to a girl has been the most challenging but also the most rewarding experience of my life for that reason because it's kind of like you know like a like if you're doing a puzzle and it's really not that hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's fun to complete the puzzle, but it's not the same as completing a really hard puzzle, you uh-huh. know? And to me, raising a daughter is like a much more difficult puzzle. And so I just really enjoy the challenge of it. Um, I'm, I'm not, it doesn't come naturally to me like it does raising the boys. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just been, it's just been so interesting. Um, are you doing it mostly by trial and error, or do you go <laughs> read books, or you know? Well, I should read more books. Um, a lot of it is learning from um, my wife, who has a much better instincts, um, making mistakes. Um, I think daughters and dads have a special relationship. Um, I'm so blessed, and I don't use that word very often, to have you know both. Um, boys and girls, but I, I, the, just having a girl and just having this experience has just been, um, just really, uh, you know, fun to, so I think, you know, part of what it is too, is I ha- I really, we call, we call, you know, we have these father daughter dates that we go on and really trying to make sure that I'm spending individual time with her versus just time, all three of us, like the boys, honestly, like we could do stuff as a threesome, you know, like we'll go, you know, throw the ball around, mm-hmm. play golf, you know, tennis or whatever it is. And it's like, you know, that's sort of, it doesn't, they don't need individual attention to not as much, uh-huh. uh, or, or at least the, the connection doesn't, at least this is my perception, uh-huh. you know, but with my daughter, like, you know, I think she really likes when we go out to like a breakfast together or do something like that. We, you know, and so, and, and I had to, because my interests are very different than hers. Like she's very interested in, um, in art mm-hmm. and in, uh, you know, uh, crafts and just things that aren't appealing to me generally. Like, you know, like sports are less interesting to her. Um, and, and that's not, that's not a boy girl thing. It's just, you know, it's an Ellie, mm-hmm. an Ellie thing yeah. versus a, and so, uh, again, the types of things that my boys are interested in, like watching sports, playing sports, doing that stuff, are the same things I'm interested in. So it's, it's somewhat easy. 
But with Ellie, you know, you, I think one of the tips is you got to kind of meet them where they are as opposed to trying to drag them into, I think, where you are. And so one of the fun things that I did is when she was little, we did the, you know, this uh, father-daughter uh, uh, Indian guides group, you know, and we went. And, and that was just alone time I spent with her and another bunch of dads and daughters. And we did stuff that the girls liked, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember, it's interesting, I remember uh, those those times because those are really fun. And um, it, it becomes harder, I'll tell you this, now that she's 16 and about to start driving, um, you know, it becomes harder to get those, those times where you can have one-on-one time. And to make sure, if I had to do it all over again, I would have, I think, spent more one-on-one time with all of them, but especially with Ellie because um, I think... Uh, I think that's really important. And I think you said something really important that I think you have to meet them where they are and um, understand them from their point of view and then kind of go from there because otherwise it's a challenging relationship, right, as opposed to kind of with your boys, you just gel basically because they're just happily doing what you're doing. Yes. uh, Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I think it's a hard challenge too. Like, so Ellie... um, I think could be a great athlete. She's fast, she's tall, she's athletic, not interested. My wife and I originally would try to do what we did with the boys, is sort of take her to practice, you know, to soccer, and try to force her to do soccer, and try to force her to do these things. What was interesting was is she just didn't want to do the soccer. She didn't want to do the softball. She didn't want, I mean, that's just not what she wanted to yeah. do. And so she just was very, you know, she made it difficult for us to do those things with her. But like, the reality was is if we wanted her to go to some art class, she was more than happy to do that. It wasn't like her. It was us yeah. putting our – what we wanted her to do. And I, I just don't think you have to make it so hard. So do you think if uh, one of your kids wanted to be an artist, right, and go to the school for art and then just continue being an artist, not particularly very high-income profession, you would encourage that? Or would you, knowing what you know now, would you still try to kind of steer them into something where the money prospects are better? Because I know a lot of parents would say, like, yeah, you, you still have to be a doctor and a lawyer and save your arts for uh, mm-hmm. after-school activities, right? But then there's other group of parents who'd say, yeah, it doesn't matter. You just got to be a, do what you like doing. And as long as you get good at it, you'll figure out a way how to make money. Like, I'm just curious where you uh, stand yeah, probably more on the latter. Mm-hmm. Um, by the way, I think being an artist used to be something that you and I would say, like, that's not interesting. Although you know, we're paying designers now almost as much as we're paying our our, our engineers. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a great designer, a great visual designer is uh, one of the most sought after uh, positions in Seattle right now. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, these things kind of go up and down. And Obviously, you know, that's being a designer uh, is different than maybe being an artist. But again, there's sometimes you can, you know, there are ways to monetize some of these skills that I think are really, uh, you know, where you sort of take a, a just one step beyond the sort of the obvious and say, wow, you know, you can use that your interest in in art and your creativity in an area that's really uh uh, really great. And so actually in this case, the reason I say that is that Ellie, my daughter is, you know, she does a lot of graphic design um, and she's so passionate about, it. we don't have to tell her to do anything. She just naturally goes and finds opportunities and at school and other places. And, and it's just, it's clearly just a passion of hers. And so my sense is that she's good at it and, and, and she'll, um, and part of the reason she's good at it, I think is because she loves it. Mm-hmm. Um, we have certain sorts of rules at our house in terms of being what we prioritize, and then we let, I think, more on the passion side. So one of the things that we've said is, is like, school's important. That's your job. Mm-hmm. You do well in school, or, or not you do well, more like you try your hardest. Mm-hmm. And that's just a value that our family has. Mm-hmm. The other thing that's important to us, same kind of value, is, is that we support each other. Uh, you support your brother and, and sister. You support your, you know, your brothers or... Um, and that there's not uh, that's not up for discussion. You know, we tried one thing that my wife did that I think was so great was early on. She decided that we would try to go to. She want she had this goal. She wanted to hit all seven continents 
as a family, just the family, um, before our oldest went to college. And so for the, at some point during the, the year, we would try to go somewhere on some vacation, but try to do it and, and see if we could hit all seven continents. Did it work out? We're not going to make it, but um, we're going to. So we're going to go to. You Af- can delay his admission by a year. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We could do it. Uh, Zach could uh, Zach could delay for a year, but no. So we we will have hit every single continent, but Antarctica. Uh-huh. I don't really have a strong desire to go to Antarctica. Um, Shannon does, and so eventually we'll probably hit Antarctica. But like. It was just kind of a fun. It kind of almost became a little bit of a game. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, you know, where are we going to go? And and uh, and we've taken those trips as a family, and I think that's brought us all closer together. Um, and I'm glad that we did that. Yeah. But you said if you were to do it again in a way, you would see if you can put even more attention into your family, right? Because now you're sort of wondering, it's like, did you do everything? So it means like, if you were to do it again, you would try. You would try to do everything. It's just so hard, especially as they get older, you'll see this as your girls grow up. Once they start driving, you don't see them as much anymore. And so your ability to kind of be a dad, uh, you, you, you're, you're more trying to parent in spots, mm-hmm. you know? And that just is a little more difficult. And, uh, and so um, I hope I'm, I mean, I'm trying my best. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, it's interesting, I told my son because I had this epiphany about like how much impact my parents had on my life. I just said, listen, you know, I want you to know that like, uh, you know, where, when I've been, when I push you and I've done all these things and here's sort of why I did it. Here's how I sort of thought about it. And I just tried to explain to him sort of where I was coming from. And I probably, before he goes, I'll have more of those kinds of conversations because I really want him to understand sort of, you know, sort of what my philosophy about being his dad in particular has been. And, Um, and it's been different for each kid and, and just so at least he sort of knows, uh, when he goes away, um, and he thinks back like, oh, here's the, he has context. Mm -hmm. Um, So maybe in hindsight for new and future parents, it may be worth to do that early on and like concurrently with parenting. It's hard. I think one of my mistakes as a parent, and I think it comes from my parents is, uh, I, uh, have very high expectations. So if you accomplish something, I probably don't um, celebrate, and I don't do this for myself either. It's a weakness that I have. I don't sort of celebrate the accomplishments. Any or is your bar for celebration is just a lot higher than? I think it's probably, no, it's just higher. Um, or even like, let's say if they're writing a paper, and I'm, let's say I'm proofreading a paper. Like, I'm not one who's like, This is a good paper. Here are some questions. I'm more likely to say, uh, um, to you know, to really be uh, critical of it and to um, you know to to push them to try to do even better. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I listen. I think that's still uh, the right way to do it. I but I think sometimes, you know, I think that that what that where that can end up is people thinking, you know, my. You know, children thinking that they can't ever please their parents. And that's not the intent, because I yeah. want them to know that, like, I am proud of them, uh, deeply proud. Um, and, that's, and that's why I'm pushing so hard. Um, and I, that's just a very hard line to walk. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, if, you, you know if, you, if nothing's ever good enough, then what you, I think, end up with is, is uh, children that I think... Uh, You know, we're always trying to, to please in a way that I don't think is as productive as it, as it might be. So I think, that, I think what you want to do is, is have people strive for excellence, but for themselves, not to please someone else. Mm-hmm. And, I don't, well, you know, and, that's, and that, that's something that I'm trying to impart now. It's like, you know, it's sort of that internal sense of, of pride. It's sort of like when Steve Jobs said, you know, he asked his father, why are we painting the backside of the fence as, as well as we paint the front side? You know, who's going to ever know? And... And his dad said, you'll know. It's like, it's yeah. that. It's like, the, yeah. it's building that internal sense of, I want to do this great work for myself yeah. um, versus doing it for my father or for some other external yeah. thing. Yeah. Now that you have kids, right, um, do you treat the world any different than you maybe did 20 years ago? And that said, 
Um, are you worried about where we're heading? Those are two difficult questions. I think being a father uh, was the most religious experience of my or spiritual experience of my life. I, it's hard to describe to to people that haven't had children how, at least for me, how different I felt after becoming a father. You uh, and I think a lot of it is just biological um, changes your perspectives and uh, and your goals. I, I, you know, I do believe that being uh, a, a great dad is you know, the most important job that I have. Um, I don't say that because it sounds good. I really do believe that. Yeah, I'm worried about where we're headed, but. You know, but more for macro reasons, you know, the way we don't seem to be taking care of our planet, the way we're so short-sighted about saddling this next generation with trillions of dollars of debt, the way we are treating immigrants and people not from our country. And so those are some, those are some areas I think we could really improve on, being more empathetic and, 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 uh, and, and just even just for, on the, on the immigrant one, just even just being smart, you know. Historically, we've been the country that has, I think, become great because we've been able to recruit the best and brightest to come to our universities, and somehow we lost sight of that as a, you know, and the core value of, of being that place where people can go to, you know, create new great things. Um, that being said, I'm optimistic, too. Um, you know, I, I spend a lot of time teaching. There's so much brilliance in you know that we have in in this next generation of folks so i'm optimistic that we'll solve all these problems um but um in some ways i feel like we as it are the older generations have been have been letting down you know our children a little bit and uh, maybe um the pendulum will swing back in the other direction uh during these next elections where we start again taking care of our planet you know, watching what we're, you know what we're leaving mm-hmm. these next generations. Yeah. Well, back to you know your day job as a VC, though, uh, because venture capital needs to create returns, yeah. right? And in a fairly short term, on the grand scheme of things, right? Where you have like maybe five, maybe ten years to return your fund. Uh, but all, all these challenges in terms of the environment, the education, are much longer. So. No, I'm not perhaps asking for a solution, but what do you think we can do better in order to address those things? Well, I think we can. I think I think I think some of the issues around artificial intelligence and mis- machine learning and all the changes that are going to come with that are much more political and societal than they are technological. And so I feel like I think our political system is is not. I think. Uh, optimized for uh, the future um, the way it has evolved mm-hmm. and I don't know what we do about that exactly you, know, you have politicians that used to be I think the concept behind our democracy was you know, citizen representatives that would go spend a couple of years and then come back to their communities and the way it's evolved now is, is everyone cares so much about being reelected that they forget why they were put there in the first place. And right. If you never come back from D.C., then there's no point of fixing wherever you came from, right? Yeah. Or uh, well, Just you start to worry more about who's giving you money to win the next election than what's the right thing to do. Um, so, I, so my hope is that over time, you know, we, you know, we, we fix that. I think we're, we're good, the, you know, as a country, specifically when – you know, when we get pushed in the, uh, I hope it's just not something catastrophic that pushes us to start to do the right things. Mm -hmm. I think most venture capitalists, they like big ideas. And I think pitching big, hairy, audacious ideas is much easier to get those funded than the small, short-term win ideas. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, again, climate change and other things like that are harder to get funded because there's not technology around that, but around uh, some of these big, uh, certainly on the information technology front and biotech front, you know, again, the, I think the bigger the idea, the more audacious it is, 
as long as you have the right people around it, the easier it is to go and raise capital. Speaking of big ideas, what do you think about Ethereum and Bitcoin and other blockchain applications? Because that seems like a way for the young generation to come out and say, you know what, instead of going to venture capital, we're just going to take money our own way from people who believe in our ideas before we even build it. And then we're going to build it and create it, and then the community will benefit. What do you think about it? Yeah, I'm not a huge, I'm a skeptic on blockchain. Um, uh, seems like it's still mostly the domain of speculators. Um, I can't think of how blockchain affects anything I do on a day-to-day -day basis. There's no, there's no activity that I'm engaged in, I would argue, that you're engaged in, that anyone's really engaged in where blockchain really has any influence. And so... Um, Maybe it's coming. I, you know, I've looked at it. You know, a thousand different ideas in blockchain. I'm still struggling to see where the advantages are so much greater uh, that you know the kind of change that it would require makes sense. Cryptocurrency. Obviously, the people have spent billions of dollars on these cryptos, and but again, that feels almost like the side area where it's more about speculation than about really creating value uh, from a business standpoint. Machine learning and AI, by the way, also hyped, but I think in many ways underhyped because already everything we do, every search you make on Google, everything you buy, the recommendations you get on Amazon, you know, anything you see on Facebook, machine learning driving a lot of that. And almost every company has started to implement machine learning into their into their business. And I think we're still very early on. But to me that is the big you're sort of what are the big trends going on now in technology that I think are are most exciting? Um, I'm, I'm skeptical of, of, of blockchain. I'm, I'm skeptical of AR, VR still. Um, I think it'll come, but I think it's just taking a lot longer, as a lot of these technologies do, to, to make sense. I think you have to you know, get the, the hardware and uh, right before it really you know, will take off in any meaningful way. But, but ML AI is happening it's happening now um and i think it's going to be a, a big deal um and i think that's going to create a huge amount of opportunity for for new technology companies and i think seattle actually is fortunate to be in the middle of a lot of uh, the best talent in in those areas that sounds very optimistic and that's a great way to look at the future that all advancement in technology like machine learning and ai and all the others will actually enable us to do more and better uh, as opposed to create any kind of problems and challenges. So short of an existential crisis killing us all, what do you think new parents should be paying particular attention to as they're raising their kids? You know, trusting your instincts. My wife, Shannon, is, is a better parent than I am. Just She's a natural. Just comes, just her, her, uh, her instincts about what to say, her patience. I mean, I really, one of the great things about doing this with another person is I can't tell you how many times I, I watch Shannon parent, um, and I think to myself, it was much better than I would have done. She's, you know, better able to figure out the right things to say at the right times and, you know, how to comfort and how to be patient. And I've learned a lot from her. From her. I think she's learned some things from me, but not as many. Mm -hmm. But I think really, tr I think so many people are looking for answers outside. And a lot of times, like, uh, you know, really learning to trust your own instincts uh, about what to do is really tends to be a good guide. So, for example, sleeping such a difficult thing, especially when you are know, young children, getting them to sleep. And, you know, there's all kinds of techniques and so forth. Um, but we used, you know, I think we did different things for all three kids um, because each of the kids is different. And the techniques and other things that worked for one kid didn't work for another. And the kinds of contraptions that one kid likes, you know, the other kid didn't like. And um, I think it just, you know, you have fun with it and really hopefully try to trust your instincts. The other thing I think, too, that's really fun is just, you know, just embracing the challenge of it, um, laughing about the mistakes that you make and, um, and don't take, you know, don't take yourself too seriously, I think is, I mean, I think... You just look back, especially now that now my kids are older, you think about the things that you stressed out about and realize how 
insignificant they they were. It's hard to do that in the moment. But my, one of my kids didn't make a, a, a select basketball team one year, and I really thought that he should have made it. And I was so upset. And you know what? Why? I mean, he was. You know, he 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 clearly wasn't going to play either high school basketball or professional basketball. Right. So, so why was I so? Because you're up? a high achiever, and it's important that yeah, you get. I, just, I mean, I'm. You know, and, and maybe you've experienced this too. But like, when it comes to your children, like you know, uh, I, I'm much. Yeah, if, if I feel like my. My children didn't get a, a fair shake. I'm much more upset than if I feel I didn't get a fair shake. And I think part of it, it's too, is just, you know, realizing that just let the small things kind of go. Well, thanks, Greg, for coming. Thank and you. And sharing your thoughts. Uh, it, it's been awesome. Yeah, well, thank you. And I, and I don't claim any uh, expertise other than uh, it really has been uh, an incredible uh, privilege to be a father for three through three kids. So um, I really, you know, people ask me, but I really recommend it. You know, I think it's one of those things where sometimes people are like, is this the right thing to do? I'm like, well, if you look at it, like over the course of one year, you're like, this is crazy. But if you look at it and say, gosh, you know, 20 years from now, how am I going to feel if I, you know, have this, you know, this person in my life, this new person? And the answer, I think for big decisions, I mean, the answers to big decisions are better made in the context of, of looking at it over many years versus mm-hmm. just that year or two where you're not going to get any sleep. So um, it's been just awesome. And, uh, and now that they're, again, older, I just can't wait for, you know, for these next this sort of this phase right before college, which is a really fun phase, too. Do, 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 do. Thanks again for listening to this episode of The Ride Dead Show. If you like this episode, check out our other episodes and please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps to spread the message. Or even better, if you know somebody who should listen to this episode or any other episode of Red Dead, please just email it to them. Let them know. And sign up for our newsletter to hear when the next episode launches. All right. Have a good one. Bye-bye.